As you know, we'll open in prayer. Father, we just thank you again for all the, the, the time that you allow us to spend together here freely without persecution. Lord, there's persecution throughout the world, and we pray for those Christians that are meeting and hiding today. We also pray for our veterans. Uh, we thank you for their service. Uh, we thank you for those that, are, that have served before. Protect them, Lord. Give them peace in this hostile world. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a youngster, Saturdays during the winter months for me were, were, were as a movie matinee in, um, in the Wildwood, the old Hunts Theater in Wildwood. We would sit there and we would watch cowboy movies and John Wayne movies and Clint Eastwood movies. And, and then we would go home and act them out. And, uh, but also on those, on those movie theaters they, at that time, they would have a cartoon that would open up. It would be like Porky Pig or Woody Woodpecker or one of those, one of those characters. But at, at times they also had, I remember, and I didn't realize it at the time because I was so young, they would have newsreels. And at that time, the Vietnam War was happening. So they would, they would uh, show these movies uh, and the horrors of war. They would have vivid, vivid displays of the military men and women that were fighting in the Vietnam War. And when I say horrors, that's just about sums it up. It sums it up. History of the United States of America includes the account of our veterans of war and from the, in, 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 from the inception of our founding. And none of the military acts escaped escape the horrors of war. And sometimes when you're exercising our rights and our freedoms, we discount the price of the men and women that gave us those freedoms and, and, and then also are maintaining them for us. And so there's a quick poem uh, that, I, that I, I always try to uh, listen to or read. And it's a veteran. It is a veteran, not the preacher, who gives us the freedom of religion. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who gives us the freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom of assembly. It is the veteran, not the lawyer, who has given us the, uh, given us the right to a fair trial. The veteran, not the politician, who has given us the right to vote. It is the veteran who salutes the flag. It is the veteran who serves under the flag. And it is the, ver the veteran who is buried by the flag. So thank you, veterans. So we're going to read 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. And it's in your pew Bibles. Uh, if you want to open that up to and read along with me, or you can just listen to me. Because you got a long way to listen to me today, folks. Now, so beginning in, in uh, verse 13 in 1 Peter, we read, And he who is... I'm sorry, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of the good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of the threats nor the trouble, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And when they defame you, defame you as evildoers, those who uh, revel your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, it is, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Amen. Amen. And so the title of this message is, I Stand by the Door. You know, fear strikes at the heart of everyone who goes for a yearly checkup and hears the dreaded news that he or she has cancer. I witnessed that firsthand. It attacks all parts of the human body. And the very word cancer carries with it fear and dread. What if you were a research scientist who had for years been studying the cause and effects of, of cancer cells, and you finally discovered a cure for cancer that included diet, natural, and synthetic medicine, and, and you've seen it work to bring healing to all types of cancer, what would you do? What would you do with that knowledge? Would you say, I've found the cure, so only my family will get to use the cure and no one else? You have made an historic discovery. You have good news. 
What will you do with good news that can help millions of people? There's a similar story in 2 Kings chapter 7 where Samaria is surrounded by the army of Ben-Hadad of Aram. And Ben-Hadad had apparently decided to starve the uh, uh, Samarian uh, army rather than attack them inside the city wall. And the people of Samaria were desperate. They were running out of food and water. People were so hungry. Listen to this. Two neighboring families agreed to eat their sons. The prophet Elisha predicted that the famine would end and the people could have plenty of food to eat. But then the pages turned in the story and we read about four lepers sitting outside the gate of the city of Samaria. And they were hungry and weak. The lepers were outcasts, as you know, of society and they were not allowed to live inside the walled city. Lepers were required to go bareheaded and to warn all who came near by calling out, unclean, unclean. Lepers lived a shameful, segregated, and separated life. The four lepers decide to take their chances and go to the Armenian army to, to, um, to beg for, for mercy and get food to eat from their enemy. And they said, if they receive us, we'll live If they kill us, we will die. We've got nothing to lose. And after the sun went down, they crept into the camp. uh, And to their surprise, not a person could be found in that camp. And the Lord God of creation had caused the army to hear the sound of horses and uh, and a mighty army on the march. And they reasoned that the king of Israel hired the king of the Hittites and the king of Egypt to attack the, uh, the Armenians um, panicked and ran for their lives, leaving behind all their food, horses, donkeys, tents, and clothes. And so the four lepers went into the tent and they found silver, gold, food, clothes, and they stuffed themselves until they could eat and drink no more. And it was now that at the middle of the night and they said to each other, we shouldn't be doing this. This is a day of good news, and we're making it into a private party. Let's go tell the news to the king's palace. While it was dark, they went back to the city of Samaria, and they ventured into the city, and they told the gatekeeper the good news. The gatekeeper woke up the king and told him the leopard story. Of course, the king was suspicious, and he believed it might be a trick of the enemy. And so he thought, If we go out, they may ambush us. And so the king finally sent five men to check out the story. The scouts saw for themselves all the food and supplies that were left behind. And when the news got out, the people of the city, they went out in masses and they filled their carts with all the food, clothes, and supplies that they could carry. And the lepers, by their share in the good news, made the day for an entire city of hungry people. Pretty fitting, huh? Good news, good news is for sharing. So do you have good news? Do you have good news? A missionary statesman defined good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ as one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Do people in our community need good news? Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. People need good news because of the fact of sin. Adam and Eve, representing all humanity, disobeyed God, you know that, and yielded to temptation and sinned. And they created perfect, they created perfect world, I'm sorry, the created perfect world became an imperfect world. And from that point on in history, sinful humanity needed a savior. If we look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we read that therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all have sinned. The penalty of sin carried two deaths, physical and spiritual death. Before the sin of Adam, the, the, the life expectancy of Adam and Eve was limitless, limitless. 
Sin brought the consequences of physical death. Today, the life expectancy is 70 plus years, and humans have lived as long as 113 of those years. And the Bible says that as the, in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Many other signs of those days of Noah are happening right now. Lawlessness, people knowing about God but not living for God, and breakdown of the family, chaos. We've seen, we see it in our world today. So ever since Adam, physical death has been appointed to all people. But a few escaped death and went straight to heaven. Enoch walked with God and one day he walked into heaven. Imagine that. Elijah was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Jesus ascended into heaven. The first death is physical and the second death is spiritual. Spiritual death we know is separation from God. Revelations, when we read that, when we went through that series weeks ago, we read in chapter 20, verses 12 through 14, that the Apostle John has a revelation from God about the final days of God's judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up their dead that were in it. And, the, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All who die with a vital, active faith in Jesus Christ will not face that second death. According to God's word, do people need to hear the good news of the gospel? Amen, they do. So why do we fail to tell others the good news of Jesus? The four lepers were tempted to hoard for themselves the abundance of food and supplies and finally, they came, in, they came to their senses and told others about the good news of what they had found. We fail to tell good news because we are ingrown and selfish. The term cocooning describes many of our 21st century culture in, in America. People want private lives and shut out the world and its concerns. Cocooning has invaded the church. We praise God for his blessings and we're so happy to form our comfortable holy huddle and sing praise God from all uh, whom all blessings flow. But we don't want to be bothered with a messy, corrupt world. <clears throat> How quickly we forget that Jesus chose to get involved. Jesus chose to humble himself and come to a sinful world. Jesus came to reveal God's love to a loveless world. And he came never beyond, he was never beyond helping a person in need. And so we fail to tell others the good news of Jesus because we are preoccupied with our own personal lives and problems. We fail to tell others the good news of Jesus because we have been persuaded and influenced by secular thinking that says everyone should do what is right in their eyes. There is no need to get excited about people spending eternity separated by God. All religions, all religions lead to God. God is love and heaven is open to all, both good and bad. We fail to tell others good news because we believe people are doing just fine. All they need is a better education, more funding, and with all the compromising, there will be peace in the earth. But we fail to tell others because we don't want to invade the private world of people. We are to be tolerant and not offend people concerning their beliefs. What will it take for us to begin to tell others and put into practice what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says? But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
God's plan, folks, is for his followers uh, is that they tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. Good cre God created Adam and Eve to enjoy a perfect world and disobedience resulted in sin and brought the fall of man, hatred, murder, strife, war, famine, disease, on and on and on and on and on. God's ultimate plan is to again create a perfect world, a world under the reign of Jesus, leading all who follow him. There are many reasons for telling good news as a Christ follower. We share the good news of Jesus because we take God for his word. The Bible is our authority. God's word is clear. Jesus gave his last commandment for his followers to become his witnesses. He told us, us followers, that we would be going to heaven to, he would be going to heaven to create a place for them, for us. And that they would not know the time of his return. And so listen to what Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive a power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Because the early Christians were obedient, there was spontaneous expansion of the church in an anti-Christian culture. So, can Cape Island Baptist Church make an impact in our anti-Christian culture? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And why? Why is that? Because God's word is true. God's word is power. God's word is not a book of fiction. It is a book of fact. The fact is, these, uh, there are many books out there uh, that, uh, I skipped the page, a while back, reference was made to, to the Da Vinci Code, that movie and that book. And many people take the best-selling novel as fact. Many people, uh, in fact, the book is fiction. Central to the book's plot line is the allegation that lost books of the Bible have been suppressed by the church for centuries. And these so-called books lost claim that Jesus married Mary Magdalene and there had children with her. And in fact, these so-called lost books of the Bible are not accepted as part of the Bible for a reason. All books of the New Testament had to meet a certain criteria by the early church leaders. And the only books included in the Gospels were written by individuals chosen by Jesus uh, as apostles. And so the books in the New Testament had to, had to have widespread ex acceptance among the early church leaders. The lost books referred to in the Da Vinci Code do not pass the test. All the 27 books in the New Testament meet the early church criteria. But because of sin, we all need a savior. Only Jesus can forgive sin. Not education, not a new world system, not a certain religion, not science or self-help therapy. Good news, folks, is for Sharon. Years ago, a pastor by the name of Samuel Shoemaker wrote a book titled, I Stand by the Door. And this book describes what our life and our ministry should be. It goes on <clears throat> to say, I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which men walk when they find God. There's no use for my going way inside and staying there when so many are still outside and they, as much as I, crave to know where the door is. All and all that so many ever find is only the wall where a door ought to be. They are creeping along the wall like blind men with outstretched groping hands. They are feeling for a door, knowing there must be a door, and yet they never find it. And so I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is for men to find the door, the door to God. The most important thing any of us, any man can do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put it to the latch. The latch that only clicks open 
uh, to the man's own touch. Men die outside the door as starving beggars die on cold nights in cruel cities in the dead of winter, die for want of what is within their grasp. They live on the other side of it, live because they have not found it. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find it and open it and walk in and find him. And so I stand by the door. Go in, go in, go all the way in, go way down into the cavernous cellars and way up into the spacious attics. It is a vast, roomy house, this house where God is. Go deep into the deepest of hidden casements of withdrawal, of science, of sainthood. Some must inhabit those inner rooms and know the depths and heights of God and call outside to the rest of us how wonderful it is. Sometimes I take a deeper look in and sometimes venture in a little further but my place seems closer to the opening. And so I stand by the door. So you can go too deeply in and stay in too long and forget the people outside the door. But as for me, I shall take my old accustomed place near enough to God to hear him and know he is there, but not so far from men as not to hear them and remember that they are there too. Where are they? They're outside the door. They're outside this church, thousands and millions of them. But more important to me, one of them, two of them, ten of them, whose hands I am intended to put on the latch. And so I stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. And so me personally, I'll stand by the door. And Jesus said, I am the door. No one enters except through me. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to me, comes to the Father except through me. So my question is, are you standing by the door? Which way are you focused? Inward or outward? Are you prepared with an answer? Are you reaching out your hand in love and gentleness and humbleness? So let's commit to not being ashamed of the gospel. Let's pray for our Cape Island Baptist network here, for our friends and our relatives, our associates, neighbors, by any means to save some. Make it your prayer. Prepare my heart, dear Lord, to have an answer. Give me your vision. Help me to stand by the door. Amen. If you'll close your eyes and bow your heads and we'll, we'll pray um, as we conclude. Father, thank you for the many ministries that we have outside this door, outside these, this, this church, Cape Island Baptist Church, outside the door that leads into your kingdom, Father. There are so many, as we read through that poem, that are just clawing and gnashing at the, at the walls and they're, they're blind and they can't find their way. That's why we're here, Lord. That's why we are here. We are doorkeepers. We are those that are to go out and, and grab their, their helpless hands and lead them to that door and put their hand gently on the knob and turn it. And sometimes we have to shove them in, Lord. Some folks may need to be shoved in. And that's not what you intend. But Lord... Let us be gentle and humble in our approach to, to those that are unsaved and our families and our, and our associates and people that we meet. Father, it's so easy. It's so easy, folks. The other day, I, uh, it took me three seconds to pray for somebody in Wawa when they just don't, I'll pray for you. Pray for them right away. It's so easy. You gave us the words, Lord. You gave me that instant. You gave me that situation. And I thank you for it. So, a lot, Father, instill that. Give that. Give everyone in this room that, that experience this week to just open in prayer. Somebody that needs prayer. Father, we just thank you again for this time that we spent together. Thank you for the ministers we have. We pray for Cape Hope and for Denise and all the things that she is uh, uh, performing in, uh, in your guidance, that she may not step ahead of you, but follow you, and that you will bless that ministry in this community.
And I'll close in him. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen.